About 45,000 years ago, two hominin species walked the Earth. One had adapted to life in Europe, while the other was an immigrant from Africa. Though they came from vastly different worlds, archaeological evidence suggests they lived in relative peace with one another. Fast forward 5,000 years, and the European species was completely wiped out. Many point to climate change as the cause, but what if that's not the whole story? When it comes to human evolution, perhaps one of the weirdest things about it is the fact that it's not linear. Looking at the idea, it's easy to think one hominin species came before the other in a succession that led to who we are today. But looks are deceiving, and what looks like a straight line is actually a web so confusing we're still untangling it. In fact, it's so complex and intertwined that our closest cousin, the Neanderthals, lived alongside ancient species like the Homo erectus, which was 1.5 million years old at this time. With that said, when it comes to our story, their time with the grandfathers of human evolution pales in comparison to their time with our ancestors, the early Homo sapiens. See, Europe, 60,000 years ago, was an unforgiving land, locked in the grip of the Ice Age. Snow blankets the ground, mammoths roam the plains, and deep in the shadows of this frozen world, two species that would define who we are today walked upright and conquered. However, only one would survive. Going by the timeline of modern archaeology, the Neanderthals were the first to arrive on the scene, stocky, barrel-chested, and ice-hardened. Homo neanderthalensis bodies were evolutionary armor perfect for the Ice Age, with features like short limbs to conserve heat, massive noses to warm the air they breathed, and thick bones built for power. Our ancient cousins called Ice Age Europe home for 300,000 years. In this time period, they thrived and pushed the boundaries of evolution, learning to create mysterious tools like the Lavawa flakes, scrapers, and spears, conquer fire, bury their dead, use pigments, and quite possibly even speak. But nothing good lasts forever, and in the case of our thriving cousins, the end began when the newcomers arrived. Coming from the plains of Africa, leaner, more agile Homo sapiens arrived in Europe around 45,000 years ago, and suddenly, everything changed. Equipped with composite tools, stitched clothing, bone needles, and fire-hardened spears. These new species didn't just adapt to their environment, they actively reshaped it. And as we will soon see, they brought with them the one thing our cousins couldn't handle, change. Now, with two undoubtedly intelligent species living in the same region, it's easy to think that they would have been locked in some kind of interspecies war. And in a way, you would be correct. For nearly 10,000 years, these two intelligent species shared the same landscape, competing for the same prey, shelter, and space. In fact, in places like Grotte Mandrin and Chateau Peron, their layers have been found to overlap, essentially meaning they had been in close proximity or relations with each other. But just when the idea of cavemen fighting ancient species began to make sense, everything came crashing down when scientists found out the two species mated. To be honest, at first glance, the idea seems insane, but the evidence supports this, as interbreeding left behind traces that we can still find today. In fact, as it stands, today, 1-2% to of the DNA in all non-African humans is Neanderthal. So what exactly is going on here? Were the two species making love or war? And most importantly, why did the Neanderthals disappear just 5,000 years after the Homo sapiens arrived? What happens when two apex species meet and only one makes it out? When you look at the mystery of the Neanderthals' disappearance, it reads like a poorly written whodunit novel. At first glance, you already know who the culprit is, and all evidence points to their involvement. However, what makes this story different is how the crime was committed. Because contrary to what you would believe, this was most likely a crime committed without violence. But how exactly did it happen? Well, instead of mindless violence, Homo sapiens outlasted the Neanderthals because of a mixture of technology, social skill, biology, and a little help from a partner in crime, technological edge. Okay, to truly understand just how important technology is to the murder mystery, you need to look back at almost every alien movie you've ever seen. Forget the cheesy plot lines and the insane action, one thing remains true in all the movies. The alien technology gives them a superior advantage in the fight against humans. Now, while Neanderthals didn't have to deal with Homo sapiens arriving in flying saucers, shooting laser beams, or at the very least, carrying a gun, they did have to deal with Aurignacian tools. See, Neanderthals, up until that point, had used simple Mousterian tools. These tools were flint-based implements that, although they were efficient, were limited in variety. Some examples of these tools were flake tools, scrapers, cutters, and thrusting spears. 
They also used bone tools and wooden tools like the ones found at sites like Schoningen, Germany. But those were very rare. Homo sapiens, on the other hand, were more than resourceful when it came to tool use. In fact, they created the first true long-range weaponry, that being the throwing spears. And when that wasn't enough, they made the atlato, a tool used for throwing spears. These contemporary tools were part of the Aurignacian tools, and as you can already guess, they enabled people to hunt more effectively and from a distance. So although they weren't expressly used against Neanderthals, the unfair advantage they gave was a cause to be worried. After all, these more advanced tools let them be safer when hunting big and ferocious creatures like mammoths, and also capture more kinds of species. But it wasn't just about hunting. Coming from another angle, early humans also needed to wear warm, fitted clothing during the harsh, frigid Ice Age episodes. And so, faced with this, the Homo sapiens developed sewing needles, and well, sewed what they needed. Neanderthals, on the other hand, lacked complex tools and clothing, and worst of all, were not as quick to invent them. So all things being equal, this disadvantage made it more challenging for them to handle the negative environmental circumstances, and that spelled doom for them. But it wasn't the only factor. Besides their technology, something Homo sapiens had that worked wonders for their survival was social structures that were far more complex and robust than those of the Neanderthals. Early Homo sapiens lived in larger, more united groups that offered a social safety net that Neanderthals lacked. Usually isolated from one another and with little genetic interchange, Neanderthals' numbers were probably dispersed in smaller groups of 10 to 20. Homo sapiens, however, lived in groups of 20 to 50 individuals. Basically, they formed larger kinship networks, had more resources to share, and exhibited a form of social tolerance. By combining resources and knowledge, these bigger societal groups helped Homo sapiens to flourish even in trying times. One way this would have truly mattered would have been when they needed to mate. Neanderthals, in contrast, were less adaptable socially, as shown by their isolated family units and occasional interbreeding which, by the way, could have further reduced their genetic diversity and survival prospects. Homo sapiens, on the other hand, also had higher reproduction rates, which meant that their population could grow at a faster rate than Neanderthals, a factor that would tip the scale in their favor. Cognitive and cultural edge Moving on from the societal structure, another thing that put Homo sapiens on the map was how they used their brains. See, the cognitive abilities of Homo sapiens were, according to archaeological evidence, more advanced than those of Neanderthals. And these abilities, more than any other thing, swung the pendulum of cultural evolution in their favor. Looking back at the records and signs they left behind, Homo sapiens demonstrated on multiple occasions a form of complex symbolic behavior. From cave paintings to the creation of portable figurines, these behaviors showed us not just the species' ability for abstract thought, but also their capacity for cultural innovation and cooperation. Now, you might be wondering what cave paintings have to do with anything, but these behaviors allowed the species to do perhaps one thing that kept them alive to date, pass down knowledge, skills, and tools across generations. It's our strongest feat as Homo sapiens, the ability to dream, tell stories, relay morals, and warn the future of what we endured in the past, and it's quite literally written throughout history. We survived by being able to tell stories. Neanderthals, however, weren't so lucky. Sure, they also engaged in some symbolic behavior, such as burial rituals and the use of pigments, but these practices appeared later, and to make things worse, were less widespread. Not to mention the fact that morphological studies suggest that Neanderthals had smaller pratial lobes and cerebellums than Homo sapiens, which may have limited their ability in tool use, visuospatial skills, and more abstract thought processes. Essentially, this cognitive difference likely slowed their ability to innovate and adapt to new challenges. And as we know, adaptation is the rule of the game. If you can't, extinction is the price that you pay. Climate adaptability. In this evolutionary whodunit, it's easy to think Homo sapiens take all the credit in the disappearance of our cousins, but the perfect crime needs the perfect assist. And when we went after our cousins, nature followed suit. From the get-go, the Homo sapiens' origins in Africa exposed them to a wide range of environmental pressures, including fluctuating climates and diseases, which likely made them more adaptable to rapid environmental changes. The Neanderthals, though, were more like a tri-winged screwdriver for a Nintendo console. They were highly specialized for cold, ice age environments and less able to adapt when the climate began to shift. And so, with the stage set, nature attacks in the form of Heinrich Events 4, which saw dramatic environmental changes around 40,000 years ago. Neanderthals were not ready. Homo sapiens, on the other hand, were. Unlike insider trading, that meant all the difference. 
because not only could they biologically survive, they could also make use of advanced clothing, trade networks, and better hunting tools to adapt to changing climates, making them more resilient in the face of environmental upheavals. And as if that wasn't an insane assist already, it turns out diseases carried by Homo sapiens, something Neanderthals had no immunity to by the way, could have contributed to their decline, as sapiens had already been exposed to a wider range of pathogens in Africa. So was this how the perfect crime was carried out? By simply being better? Well, yes. See, over time, Homo sapiens greater numbers, technological innovations, and stronger social cohesion gave them a gradual advantage. Their ability to outbreed Neanderthals, coupled with their greater adaptability, allowed them to dominate without the need for violent conflict. Eventually, Neanderthals dwindled in numbers, possibly outcompeted by sapiens in a slow evolutionary race for survival. But what if I told you that that was just part of the picture? Because one more thing led to their disappearance, interspecies breeding. Interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals didn't just leave genetic echoes in modern humans, it may have sealed Neanderthals' fate through genetic assimilation. In perhaps the most shocking move, when the two species met in Europe and Asia around 50,000 years ago, they didn't just compete, they mated. To make things worse for our cousins, the resulting hybrids often integrated into Homo sapiens groups, effectively draining the already fragile Neanderthal gene pool. This gene flow was largely one way, as genetic studies reveal that while 1-2% of DNA in non-African modern humans comes from Neanderthals, there's virtually no Homo sapiens DNA in late Neanderthals. Even mitochondrial DNA, which is passed from mother to child, is also absent, suggesting most interbreeding involved Neanderthal males and Homo sapiens females, and with their children raised in sapiens groups, that meant there were fewer full-bodied Neanderthals over time with a total population possibly under 70,000 and effective breeding numbers as low as 3,000. Every interbreeding event chipped away at Neanderthal continuity. In fact, a 2022 study tells us how this genetic dilution was enough to push them past the threshold of recovery. Unlike Homo sapiens, who reproduced faster and in larger interconnected networks, Neanderthals were isolated, slow breeding, and genetically vulnerable due to interbreeding and earlier population crashes. To make things worse, not all hybrids thrived, and nature once again came with the assist as natural selection weeded out many Neanderthal genes, especially those related to fertility, basically making some offspring barren. Combined with Neanderthal's already lower fertility that was possibly worsened by genetic incompatibilities, their numbers declined further. In essence, interbreeding wasn't a simple exchange of genes, it was a demographic trap. Each hybrid absorbed into Homo sapiens populations was one less Neanderthal in an already dwindling lineage. They weren't wiped out in a war, they faded, generation by generation, until the distinct Neanderthal identity vanished into ours. Extinction came not with a bang, but with a whisper of shared DNA. Neanderthals are gone, but not really. Their bones may lie silent under ancient soil, but parts of them still live in us, in our skin, in our immune systems, in the fragments of DNA that whisper of a time when we weren't alone. We didn't just defeat them, we merged with them, we took their strength, their adaptations, their vulnerabilities, and we folded them into our story. In doing so, we blurred the line between survival and erasure. So what does that make us? Victors? Relatives? Thieves? This wasn't just the end of a species, it was the beginning of a pattern, a quiet conquest, not of war, but of absorption. We didn't have to kill every Neanderthal, we just had to outnumber them, outbreed them, and eventually outlast them. And that raises a deeper question, was this our first extinction, or merely the oldest one we've traced? Have we always expanded at the expense of others, other cultures, other species, other ways of being? What if they had survived? Would we share cities with them? argue philosophy? Would there be Neanderthal scientists, artists, and politicians making them peers, not footnotes? Or were we always destined to walk this road alone, carrying only their remnants inside us? In the end, the Neanderthals didn't vanish in some grand apocalypse. They faded, slowly, quietly, into us. Their extinction wasn't an event, it was a process, and we are the product. We are the living proof of what remains when one world consumes another, a hybrid species hunted by the ones we left behind, and perhaps by the knowledge that we might do it again. But what do you think? Was it just climate and coincidence that wiped out the Neanderthals, or did our species quietly, systematically outcompete them into extinction? 
For years, we've painted ourselves as peaceful migrants, blending into the Neanderthal world through interbreeding and cooperation. But what if the truth is colder? 